Yeah, I was talking about depression, and, um, and it's actually been a little more acute for the last 28 months. But the more I hear the young people of, and the up-and-coming leaders of the future, the more comfortable I feel. And, and these three individuals are just such uh, amazing uh, leaders. I guess the first question is the uh, powerful interests who are functioning and prospering very well using the public realm um, are not about to say, gee, that's a good idea, Salida. That, is, that last slide with the plug and everything else, that's great. Um, we'll start paying for it. Uh, any thoughts about wh where the, this would go from here? And all of you are welcome to answer these questions, by the way. But maybe we start with you. And I'm sure the audience has got a lot more for you as well. Sure. And is this... Work. Is this is okay? Yeah, it always cracks me up whenever I'm in one of these presentations and I'm talking about like flying taxis and, and uh, autonomous vehicles, but we can't get the AV to work, uh, the tech to work, right? Um, so here's the thing. This idea that we would use um, a whole new vocabulary of digital infrastructure to manage the fleets on our streets, which includes UPS, FedEx, Uber, Lyft, Dominoes, I don't know. Um, it re it's really about resetting the relationship of government to business because right now we actually do put, uh, we, we do place a price on the operations of those businesses and they're expressed in the form of parking tickets. So UPS pays millions of dollars every year to the city of Los Angeles uh, for in parking tickets. And they would much, much rather invest in better digital infrastructure and better management of the public realm. So in some cases, it's important for us to have that regulatory hammer, uh, which we have with scooters. In other cases, it, it's important for us to look for wins for everybody. Um, because, you know, if I could, for example, if I could say to um, Uber and Lyft, you know, from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. on 7th Street in downtown Los Angeles, you can't pick up and drop off at the curb because that street has to be for transit. There's a bus a minute. Uh, there's uh, thousands of pedestrians spilling out of the 7th Street Metro Station. And there's a protected bike lane. Um, I would make that street function better for everyone, including Uber and Lyft, because they would not be dropping people off in the middle of an active travel lane. Um, they could get to the curb, finish their trip, and pick up the next person more efficiently, which is really what they're all about. So I think there are ways to get to wins, and then I think there are places where we need coalitions to say cities need to be back as the hub in the middle of this wheel so that we don't lose that, our cities uh, and everything that we love about them. Let me put your two colleagues on the point. Montu, uh, well, you have a point, but I'll let you go ahead and say it. But then the, the, I'm going to follow up with a question. What could the health department be doing to help facilitate this kind of movement? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, your question brought me back to uh, a time that I did an interview around the housing crisis in the Bay Area. And a caller called in and said, you know, well, it's just the market. It's what the market does, and it it's just operates on its own. And... The issue with that, and Selena, I think, touched upon this a little bit, is that businesses operate on rules, regulations, and assumptions. So they often will think, and this happened with a housing developer, where they built a housing complex, and they said, well, we're going to put uh, either a, uh, a gym inside of it, or we're going to put a community garden. We're not sure which one to do. Now, most people would have said, oh, put the gym inside there, they'll use it more. But when they actually poll the people who would live there, they wanted a community garden. Mm -hmm. And so the assumption that most people will make is that people want this. And I think what Selena's pointing to is that there are things that could be done, and I think we have to talk to people, understand really what they want and what they need, and we have to change the rules and the regulations that go along with decisions that people make. Now, not all of those are legislative. Some of those are just practice. And so I think there are things that organizations can do, both at the government level and as well as business level, that don't require legislation. It's just a question of how you think about what your end goal is. 
And so I think as a health department, again, sort of thinking about what we can do in terms of data, thinking about what we do in terms of hearing and getting input from community um, to say, here's what's missing in this neighborhood, here's what we need, would also give information and data for people to make a different decision and be justified in that way. Um, and we can do the same thing with elected leaders, those who make those decisions, those who influence regulations. We can look at laws and think about measures that should go along with laws and make those recommendations based on what we understand in terms of its impact on health uh, and well-being. And I have to stick in the health realm because when I get out of that, I lose my credibility. No, it's true. <laughs> Well, and I think it's, you know, as an add-on to that, public health and public health leaders in both my work when I was in San Francisco and here were the earliest and strongest champions of Vision Zero, which is a really radical notion. And though the work of um, uh, Megan Weir and the San Francisco um, County Department of Public Health, Gene Armbruster here, was instrumental in coming up with those maps that Juan put up on the screen, right? That evidence-based, rigorous look at data. Um, and, and the, but it took us doing what Dr. Davis talked about. We had to learn each other's languages. We had to learn vocabulary, just like we need to do that with across the aisle with the private sector right now. Are you, are you doing uh, interagency uh, personnel transfers for six months or so? We found at CDC, and I, this sounds crazy, we would have an FBI person come and work in the director's office, and we'd send somebody up to the FBI, because their agenda and ours were so different. And they thought about surveillance, they thought one thing, we thought something else. That's right. And, um, so, but I, I'm just putting that, positing that um, the, they're so different. The cultures are so different. Yep. I'm stunned by how much all the people interested in climate change, and the sum right now is so much less than the parts. We're not as effective as we should be we're in so many ground. of these arenas. We're not. Pardon me? We're losing ground. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, Juan, you, I'm sorry. I was going to say really quickly, so we don't necessarily do transfers, but one of the things that we can do is actually sit and have a conversation. Um, and it's a, as part of that multiple conversations about what is it that you're doing, what are your limitations, uh, what things might me help you do, what are our, our things that, we're, that are important for us, but it's that dialogue that we don't have. So I think that is actually a really good idea to be able to put people over there, um, but at the same time, we can also do it just by having a dialogue in terms of, of thinking about the community and what both of our priorities are. So I have seen a successful model uh, with that LA County Public Health Place program where they're actually doing work in the communities, working at times with our graduate students, researchers. I remember uh, about four years ago we had a project with uh, Kudahe, which was looking at transportation impacts, looking at health impacts, and worked with UCLA planners to figure out how to do this kind of vision zero type planning that LA City has capacity to do, but maybe the other 87 cities in the unincorporated area aren't as great at. And so that's a, not necessarily cross-pollination between different divisions, but uh, it's bringing those ideas to new realms where you, I mean, cities are the, the kings of land use and street management uh, of their own Or domains. queens. Or queens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and so you have to work with cities to accomplish those types of things, and I've seen that quite successfully through that program. Juan and Salida, you showed a map, that, and I was struck that the most obese, least parked, hottest parts of Los Angeles happen to be where the LA River goes through, and I was wondering if any of you would care to comment on that, please. Well, the city really, you know, my boss, who's amazing, Mayor Garcetti, has made the LA River uh, a centerpiece of his administration in trying to untangle the unbelievably dense layers of jurisdiction that preside over the LA River. I mean, we're talking about the Army Corps of Engineers, we're talking about in some cases Federal Railroad Administration, which believe me, you do not ever want to deal with. She's right. um, <laughs> You know, all of those kinds of, of jurisdictional issues, um, as well as, you know, Department of Water and Power has high tension power lines over it. Uh, and then, you know, what he's really up against and what we're really up against is that for decades and decades, the city turned its back on the river. 
Um, and you know, we we have a lot of friends of the LA River and other folks to to thank for um, doing early and thankless work to try and bring attention back. But what that means is that the land use that surrounds the river and its concrete basin um, is was considered industrial and throwaway land. And it's a huge opportunity that could be transformational for this city and this county for generations if we are able to pick away and undo all of that. But we also run a very high risk of, um, because we've just failed utterly to build the amount of housing that we need in this region, when we build it, um, especially around, a, 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 and we do these massive developments, Sometimes it is so precious and we do such a good job that we displace folks, that the neighborhoods change. And if you look at a neighborhood like Lincoln Heights, uh, where the LA River runs through and there's a big project there, which is exciting, but also really um, scary, I think, uh, that, that we could um, lose a lot of the cultural identity of the city if we're not really thoughtful about um, how we balance the needs of the people who are there, especially people who, um, you know, they're renters and they don't have housing stability. They're scared when a Safeway moves in, in the sense that, you know, it's a food desert, yet this means gentrification in a, in a fairly profound way. A quick, maybe the two folks from the city, you're here at the university. Are there requests that you would put to those in the leadership of the Transportation Institute of the School of Public Health, about what are the things that you would need from the university, number one. But then secondly, I'd like to ask you to offer some advice to the young people in the room who are thinking about careers, and they're faced with the fact that all the careers are very narrowly slotted. You stay, mm -hmm. you come into the job, and then you stay in that slot, and you're not allowed to think bigger than that. And so many of them come back and they say, I'm so frustrated because they tell me to be quiet about the things I really care about. So mm -hmm. that's a two-part question or comment, please. So um, Juan knows I tell the Institute what I want from it all the time um, <laughs> on a pretty regular basis. And, uh, and, they, and, and the university really does deliver. I think UCLA is uh, exceptional. And, and the other one that I won't name as well does a pretty good job. Um, but UCLA was the first and the most frequent to invite uh, people from the city. And when I got here, I uh, received one of the warmest welcomes from this community um, about sort of practice-based research. So um, how can I say this nicely? So I've been doing this for 20 years in a lot of different places, Seattle, Bay Area, here. And um, the academic community often wants to study what the academic community wants to study. And when practitioners say that has zero use in the real world, um, it doesn't really land. But it usually lands here. Um, and so for that, I'm really grateful. And we actually marched up to Sacramento and advocated heavily for um, UCLA to get funding from the state uh, to do that kind of research. And you only get those kinds of successful outcomes. Look, academics and, and researchers can say things that I can't because people don't trust government. Y'all don't trust government, right? <laughs> um, and, and so can public health uh, professionals, frankly, which is why the messenger is so important. So from my perspective, you know, I think that I would love to see um, a lot more busting of the cross-discipline boundaries in, in academia. And I know that's political for y'all in a way that I can't possibly understand. Um, but I would uh, love to see leadership around issues of intersectionality. And I think that you know, you have one uh, school of thought and research here that's very powerful about the needs of women in transportation. Um, they need access to a car. Um, you have another school of, of thought and research here in rigor that's about how we got to drive less um, if we're going to survive as a species. And so where's the bridge between those? Um, and, and I would just say, you know, be bold, say crazy things, push us really hard um, because you have credibility in ways that we don't. Um, I don't think anybody could ever accuse Brian Taylor of not um, saying crazy things. He does that really well. Um, and then I guess for people who are just starting out in your career, I would say that there are more and more of those kinds of cross-disciplinary opportunities. Specifically, the divide used to exist pretty heavily between tech 
and urbanism. So you could be in the in Silicon Valley or you could be a good public servant, but you couldn't do both. And now I'm seeing a ton of cross-pollination in that arena, really led by the scooter companies. They have been very strategic in poaching some of the best people um, from cities and from pub the public sector. But I think overall that's going to be a good thing for us. So I think this is an interesting moment where you can chart a new path for yourself um, that definitely didn't exist even five years ago. Wow. Want you? So I just say come to public health. We don't have a lot of things. You can look around <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Um, and actually, in truth, it is a big and growing field, um, and actually the school of thought in terms of public health in many different sectors is actually really important um, in ther terms of thinking about the larger community. Um, in terms of uh, young folks just starting out, um, I'll tell you a quick story, because we ran into the same issue, uh, just in terms of, you know, as I was going through my fellowship uh, in minority health policy, um, it was wonderful to be with a, a cohort of people and people who had gone through the program and talk about all the crazy things we would want to do in terms of improving health disparities and achieving health equity. And then the folks who graduate said, yeah, but when I get to my job, you know, I, I can't say those things. They don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And so my program director looked at us and said, imagine what it's like when you're not there. Now, how many times have you been in a meeting where somebody said something, it got ignored, nobody heard it, then somebody else said something, it got picked up, and they got all the credit for it. It probably started with that person who first said it. So you have to be at the table. I can't say that you can scream like you may want to scream. You may not say it like you were saying it to your homegirl or your homeboy. You may have to say it a little bit differently. And sometimes community gets upset, especially as public health practitioners. We can't quite say it like the community would want us to say it. But we say it in a way that it's heard so that that continues the conversation. And so sometimes you just have to, to say it a little bit differently. Um, but you get the same message across. But you want to keep the conversation because that's how you change thought. Yeah, I always used to joke that uh, all the good ideas, the first time the boss hears it, it's a lousy idea. That's a lousy idea. After the 37th time, the boss says, oh, that was my idea in the first place. <laughs> 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 how about we... Uh, Go to the attendees and thank you so much for the excellent attention and staying with us. We'll go to, I'm going to let the person, that, well, why don't you start with this gentleman, then this gentleman, and then this gentleman, and then we have to stop doing gentlemen. Go ahead. Ryan. Uh, and please Ryan, identify yourself. because yeah, My name is Ryan Snyder. I, I live here in Westwood and uh, teach in the urban planning department and work as a transportation planning consultant. When I see the statistics on crashes, on obesity, but especially on climate change, it strikes me that we have to get across a much greater sense of urgency about these issues. I mean, the pace that we're reacting to climate change and obesity is not meeting the obligation. And when people are so concerned about losing two lanes of traffic on a six-lane street, that they're willing to fight for that. They don't understand the urgency. And I just want to get your reaction as to what we can do to try to raise the sense of urgency in the general public. I, I think one of the perhaps crazy things that Professor Brian Taylor says is he has a theory of scope of uh, public decision-making being identical to the size of the map on your wall. So if the map on your wall is a council district, you might be really concerned about moving three-lane road to a two-lane road. But the map on your wall is the state of California. Let's leave it at that for now. Um, you might be really concerned about these global environmental problems. These are things that are affecting statewide equally. So um, increases in temperature, sea level rise, uh, wildfires that are killing people in it with increasing uh, frequency and severity, um, perhaps because of climate change. And so I think that's why we're seeing some of those things I presented in one of my last slides, is that at the state level, where they're thinking about these bigger problems, they're thinking that climate change actually is changing the local uh, authority over land use, the power that states have delegated to local governments to consider <coughs> certain issues. and so. I do think the urgency is felt, but not universally. But in California, it's felt at the scale that's dealing with that problem. 
I think that we're going to have to figure out, you know, we're really good at behaving in the, in the collective good when we're at the ballot box. We vote to tax ourselves for transit in the hopes that all these other suckers on the freeway will get on the public transit. Um, and the, the traffic will part like the Red Sea. We have research, and that is exactly why. It's exactly people why do people do it, right? Uh, they, they voted to invest, and we vote to invest in, in um, housing, permanent supportive housing. We vote to invest in, but when it comes time for it to be down the street from us, or when it comes time for uh, a lane of traffic to be given over to a bus or a high capacity rail line, um, it's people's people's reaction is very visceral, and I am not sure. And that's where I think, Dick, you and I at our very first meeting, I said, you know what, I would love is if I could get a behavioral psychologist, an anthropologist, an artist, a community <coughs> member, and a public health professional to go out into a neighborhood and to talk to folks about how we talk about streets and how we talk about climate, because the plain fact is that our way of life has to change. It is not going to be the way that it is today. And part of that means that you can no longer drive as much as you do currently, even if it's in an electric vehicle. And that means that I need to be able to give you choices. And in order to give you choices, I have to change the design of the street. And it is about our parents and our kids. If I can have I'm one. sorry, I can't resist. A couple of things just shocked me about public leaders coming out. One was the Paris floods, you remember? And within a day, a scientific group came out and said 30% of the flooding, the increase was due to climate change. And that was all over the newspapers for several days. And people love Paris. The second one, this was a very conservative governor in the South who said, you know, we've had three one in 500 year floods in my state in the last three years, and I'm beginning to think this is real. And I think we've got to really... The, the, and we, we say this in medicine, there are windows of op teachable moments in medicine where the patient doesn't listen until they listen, right? For me, what I found is sometimes, depending on the audience, um, it's hard to talk about climate change because it's so abstract. I mean, there's some concrete things in relationship to it. So the way that I've actually gone about it was to pick the things that needed to happen in order to change what we're seeing as, uh, in terms of uh, uh, having more climate change, negative effects. Um, to focus in on those smaller tasks that people have some more value to um, and try to do as many of those things in as many different areas as possible in order to get to that. But for some, you can talk about climate change. Um, and so you have to know the audience in terms of getting there. Um, you know, for some, climate change is a buzzword. It works for them. For others, talking about transportation, safe streets, uh, and active you know, transportation um, is, the, is the better way to go. I'm going to ask the speakers to, or the questioners, to really give a question rather than a, a statement. So this gentleman's way over there, so you're going to have to pass it over to him if you don't we're mind. Speak loud. Well, you're, we're online here, so that's why I'm a little embarrassed about some of the things I said. It'll be recorded someday and thrown back at me. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Uh, my name is Mike Ruff. My wife and I live in the neighborhood. We sold our car because we don't want to drive. We go everywhere in public transportation and walk about five to seven miles a day. My So do the same, everybody. Everyone who clapped. <laughs> it's easy, y'all. The question is. <laughs> okay. No, we're retired. We can, it's more easier for us. But my question is this. You've mentioned the outrage the public raises against that bike lane or that uh, public space alongside the, uh, the expo line. Have you scratched beneath the surface to see whether those crowds really represent the community? We're becoming smarter about some of these things because the public, the uh, social media are being used by those who want to bring about a certain change. And there's an instance in one of the southern states where the, in Nashville recently, where the public wanted more transporta public transportation. But some organization filtering from the Koch brothers came down and suddenly in the last few days, uh, well, you know the story. We're, we're down to about 10 minutes, Mike. So the question is, the question how do we is deal with... Scratch beneath the surface to look right. where that's coming from. So you know how to deal with that. Thank you very much. So it's an excellent question, and it's, uh, it's my life's work. <laughs> Figuring out how do I get... Um, I have a, an uh, Uncle Aaron, very wise man, law professor at University of Mississippi, um, and he heard me speak once and he was incensed and he came up to me and he said, Salita, you're up here talking about the community says this, the community says that, the community doesn't say a damn thing. 
It's the individuals who have the luxury and the leisure to be able to show up to your community meetings on a Wednesday night when everybody who has two jobs is trying to put food on the table for their family and they figured out a way to game your system. And from that moment on, I abolished those kinds of meetings because they are completely unhelpful and they don't help us understand you know, what are the conversations that, that, that everybody is having and what that requires us to do as professionals is to sit down, be humble, shut up and listen and go into spaces that are beyond our comfort zone um, like uh, faith-based communities and, like, uh, and, and to empower messengers and champions in, from those communities um, to get in there and, and work, work with us um, on those kinds of projects. Because if we continue to do outreach the way that we do it now, um, we, will, we will absolutely fail. Um, lucky for me, uh, the councilman who represents uh, that district where we put in that bike lane um, had a tremendous amount of political courage and he did do some polling um, in that neighborhood and he does live in that neighborhood and he could scratch the surface. And while that project has been very divisive, there's no question about it. It was very clear that uh, there was there is a group of folks in that neighborhood and people who use that street every day who really love it. So sometimes it's, it's necessary to get over that initial um, sort of change uh, anxiety spike by trying to throw out the old book for how we used to do outreach and come up with some more creative ways to get to, to, get to everybody's table, not to expect everybody to come to ours. And every study of formal public participation so, finds that but, uh, those participating oh, in the sorry. public process aren't sociodemographically representative of the community. And every study shows that. And Seattle, a few years ago, decided to do something about that. They looked at who was on their neighborhood councils, uh, what they represented sociodemographically versus the neighborhoods that they were in, found that there was a big disconnect in who was participating in formal processes, and actually changed their entire community representation system and now are focused on these types of meetings, like Salita talked about, going to places where people are already meeting rather than having everybody come to you and self-select into the process. I really like these concrete answers. No, they're, they're very down to earth. Um, sir, identify yourself and please make sure it's a question. Frank Matricardi, and my question is this. You all did a great presentation tonight. Unfortunately, uh, someone didn't get the memo, and that's the developers who are trying to go vertical on the west side, near west side of Los Angeles. My colleague Ron and I live in South Carthay between Fairfax and La Cienega. In the next two years, there will be approximately 600 cars added to the linear, the linear mile between Fairfax and La Cienega. It's not even a mile, it's probably three quarters of a mile. How do you stop the, not the, the traffic accidents and the pollution not to mention climate change, I don't care at all about the fields. Okay, there's the question. So, thanks, Frank. Comments, please. So, I get to say crazy things, because <laughs> I'm based here and not in the city of Los Angeles. And I would love to see those developments be twice as tall, but with no parking. So, <laughs> you get to live in them if you want to walk and take public transit everywhere, walk five to seven miles a day, enjoy the Mid-Wilshire, um, the Bray Tar Pits, LACMA, live near that at perhaps a more affordable place <coughs> because of the height and density that they're accommodating all that new housing. But if you just want to go and drive to Burbank every day, this isn't the housing for you, and it shouldn't be. But, it, you know, and that's a, that's a planning decision in terms of approval of the project. Um, one of the things that um, I think we have to do better as, as public health departments is actually working with planning departments to give them some guidelines or recommendations on guidelines and practices in terms of, of ana analyzing projects and making decisions about those or making recommendations to the governing body that uh, would finally approve them. Um, but it's an important uh, cross-pollination that has to happen in that regard. I'm getting flagged that there's only time for one more question, and we've had three guys already. We have to have. Oh, all right. Please. I'm going to ask you to repeat it just because we're being uh, live streamed. Oh, 
sorry. But remember, a question, please. <laughs> uh, my name is Kara Sergiel. I'm an active transportation consultant and credentialed school nurse. And the group that I don't see here at the table is public education. Um, these problems that we deal with in, health, in active transportation and transportation planning always have an educational component. It repeats itself over and over and over and over and over. And I don't see us doing enough in public education. What do you want to say about that? So I'm really proud of our um, Safe Routes to School program at the city of Los Angeles. We have the largest one in the nation um, that, uh, in terms of participation. We just got another, I don't know how many millions of dollars um, to implement Safe Routes to School improvements around the top 50 schools in Los Angeles. And we're only able to do that through very um, intentional partnerships, both with administration and LA Unified, and also with the parents and teachers and faculty at those individual schools. <laughs> Uh, because it's, uh, you know, about 40% of the traffic in the afternoon um, around in neighborhoods is from parents who are picking up and dropping off kids because we stopped investing in busing a long time ago. Uh, we, we have neighborhood schools in Los Angeles, which is great, um, but we also have parents who are driving, you know, one kid uh, four blocks to school because they don't feel comfortable letting their kid walk or bike to school and that's not because of stranger danger anymore. It's because they don't feel comfortable letting their kid cross the street. So in, from, from our perspective, we're doing as much as we can to create those partnerships. We also do a ton of work with bike, uh, um, uh, safe walking and biking education programs in schools. We have partnerships with um, the professional sports teams in Los Angeles. We do competitions among schools to have the highest number of kids. Um, take a pledge to and learn about safe walking and biking and pass that on to their parents. Um, so we do an awful lot, but it would, and this year for the first time, LA Unified actually decided that they wanted to own Safe uh, International Walk to School Day, which is a huge, huge victory because huge. if LA Unified decides that it's a priority for them, um, then, you know, we're here with the dollars to invest in the infrastructure, the money to put into programming. Um, and the staff devoted to creating those partnerships. Mike, identify yourself, and um, it, it's got to be a question. <laughs> Michael Kahn, UCLA Bicycle Academy. Is there a doctor on board? There's transportation engineers, there's urban planners, there's public health, but the doctor with the scrubs who speaks to the public about what automobilitis really does. <laughs> you know, we, we, I, I want to see more of those doctors and more of the health institutions involved in these discussions. This is for you and me, Monte. Exactly, exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Um, and it is one of the things that we try to do as much as possible uh, either. And, and I think this is going to change over the years um, and actually going to those places where those discussions are happening and actually talking about what we see and the importance of it. Um, typically, when I've seen in, in local jurisdictions where things really change at that decision-making level is usually when there is uh, both uh, the agency responsible for it, uh, potentially public health, the community, uh, and physicians uh, talking at the same time and speaking the same thing in terms of the importance of something. And so um, I think it is a really great point in terms of that, and it's something I think we have to do more for um, and it's interesting, physicians sometimes get heard a little bit better than the community. Terrible. Um, but I'll take advantage of it. <laughs> Actually, the physicians are often so busy, they never show up at planning meetings. But they will come, if you say, between 7.15 and 7.25, show up in your scrubs and you have to say this, this, and this. And they say, okay, I'll do that. And, but it's got to be pretty protected time for them because they don't have a lot. And their message is, we can get as uh, verbose as anyone, so you got to really help us keep it to the point. But uh, We've actually had great success in working with um, the folks who work in the um, trauma centers, both in, when I was in San Francisco and now here. We had the head, uh, head trauma surgeon at Children's Hospital actually um, do a piece in a, a public education video that we did about Vision Zero because um, doctors do have um, its magic when y'all talk. And uh, to say, to hear a doctor say, the way that we're going to save kids' lives is by slowing down, and not the way that we're going to save kids' lives is by, you know, making sure that we're not looking at our cell phone in the crosswalk. 
is really meaningful and powerful, and it goes way further than anything I could ever say. We have a surveillance um, program partnership with some of the trauma centers here in Los Angeles, and the same thing exists in San Francisco because of the data. The data, the traffic crash data that we get from comes through the California Highway Patrol. Um, there are a lot of underreported severe and fatal crashes that happen to people biking and walking where the cops never get called. Um, but the trauma centers have the information. And so those partnerships and those surveillance programs where we can share information um, are really complex because of HIPAA and privacy and lots of reasons. Um, but they're also really, really powerful in making sure that we understand the full picture and spectrum of what we're dealing with. You know, this has been a terrific panel, and it, I, I love the troika, the balance. It's a three-legged stool that really has uh, stability, and, and I want to thank you all before Mike uh, gets up to close. Them.